Hey, everybody. Uh, I'm Brett Harvey, the coach of the Mississippi State Debate Team, and welcome to what may be your first video on our channel, and, and maybe even your first video about debate competition, period. Uh, if you're watching this, you're probably getting ready to debate the new novice LD debate topic resolved in the United States, national service ought to be mandatory, which means you are probably uh, brand new to Lincoln Douglas, and you may even be new to speech and debate competition in general. If that's the case, let me be one of many to say welcome. Uh, debate is a fantastic, life-changing activity. You will meet amazing people. You'll travel. You'll learn an incredible amount of stuff. Uh, so many successful people get their start in this activity. So if you're wondering, am I in the right place? You absolutely are. Uh, our channel, Hale State Debate, is devoted to teaching debate in a way that combines what you might call the debate world uh, with the real world. We have a lot of talented college debaters on this team who help research all of this. They know a lot about the technical aspects of debate, the terminology, the rules, the strategies, things like that, that you might be wondering about. But we try to translate all of that uh, debate stuff into common sense, real world arguments that any judge can understand and hopefully vote for. Uh, that's kind of what our channel is about. And it's a strategy that I try to teach to every new debater that I work with. So in this video, we're gonna do what we always do, which is break down a particular topic, in this case, the national service topic. And we're basically gonna walk through all the parts of the case on both sides. So we'll start with some factual background, then we'll define the words in the resolution, then we'll talk about values and criteria. And don't worry, we will explain what those are and what they do. Uh, then we'll move on to some contentions, in other words, the substantive arguments on both the affirmative and the negative side. And along the way, we'll talk a little bit about strategy. Uh, for example, we might say, here's something that you'll want to include in your case on the affirmative. Uh, here's how you push back against that on the negative. And in, in this particular video, we're going to try to break down some debate concepts and terms that might be new to you uh, as we go so that you can use them not just on this topic, but in the future on other topics as well. Now, we usually start these videos with some general thoughts on the topic, so I'll keep that fairly short this time around. I think this resolution is an upgrade from the old novice topic that we had for many years, which was resolved in a democracy, civil disobedience is morally justified. Don't get me wrong, I think the older topic served the debate community very well for many years, but it was fairly narrow, and I do think it was time uh, for a change. Now, this topic about national service is one that we have seen from the NSDA before. In, in 2017, we started the year with a very similar resolution in the United States, national service ought to be compulsory. And I think it's a nice, balanced resolution. On the affirmative side, there are some strong practical arguments about the good things we could do through national service. Uh, there are arguments about building a shared sense of community and national purpose, which we're sorely lacking as a country. And then there are some more advanced philosophical arguments, for example, about the obligation that come along with our rights as part of a larger community. Uh, on the negative side, obviously, there are arguments about autonomy, uh, liberty. Uh, there are concerns about the proper role and, and power of government and the danger of government forcing people into labor under any circumstances. Uh, there are also practical arguments about how a program like this could be abused for political purposes and serious questions about whether we really need it at all and, and who would benefit from it. So there's a good bit of flexibility, but not so much that this topic will consume your whole life. And I think that that is the mark of a really good debate topic. I will say, uh, for the record, that I am not crazy about how the NSDA board went about deciding to replace the old civil disobedience topic. I won't bore you with a bunch of details, but I'll say that basically the change was due to concerns that some debaters might have been uncomfortable debating the negative side of the old civil disobedience topic because of their uh, moral beliefs. Uh, but I think it's worth noting that that is precisely what debate is supposed to do. That's how we grow intellectually, by being made uncomfortable. And all resolutions make at least some people at least a little bit uncomfortable. For example, uh, the affirmative on this topic about national service might make some libertarians who believe strongly in individual freedom uncomfortable to debate. But we not only accept that as members of the debate community, we embrace it because that's how we learn to be better advocates in the long run. Anyway, that little aside, uh, aside, uh, substantively, it is a very good topic and we have to get ready to debate it. So let's jump right in and start off with some factual background, then definitions of terms, then values and criteria, affirmative arguments, negative arguments, and then final thoughts. So let's start as we usually do on the channel with a little bit of factual background on the topic. Uh, 
Uh, this is important because a lot of times in debate, especially as a brand new novice debater, you'll run into opponents who don't know much or really anything about the topic beyond what's written in their case and maybe a few rebuttal files, which we sometimes call block files. And if you don't have a strong understanding of the general background on a topic, you're going to be kind of stuck debating just a handful of narrow points. You're not going to be very flexible or adaptable. And if the debate goes in a direction that you're not prepared for, you may just be out of luck. But if you've actually learned and read well beyond your cases, if you're you know talking from a full head is the uh, term we like to use, you're going to be a lot more versatile. You're going to be able to respond better to questions, put things in context to show why your arguments matter more, and just generally sound like a smarter, better informed person, which judges tend to really like. So to start with, in the United States, the idea of mandatory national service obviously is controversial, which is why we're debating it. Uh, it's more controversial here than in many other countries that have some form of national service, at least military service. So we might ask, what is the difference? Why are Americans fairly skeptical about this? I would suggest that there are a couple of reasons. One is broad and philosophical, and another one is narrow and practical. Um, broadly speaking, the United States has a political culture that just really emphasizes individual rights and self-determination over the collective good. Just look at our Constitution. The first eight amendments of the Bill of Rights are all about things government can't do to you or can't demand from you. The First Amendment says the government can't stop you from speaking or practicing your religion. The Second Amendment says they can't take away your firearms. The Fourth Amendment says they can't search your home or arrest you without a warrant and so on. Um, and while there are, of course, limits on individual freedoms, the notion of personal liberty in the United States and autonomy is really baked into our political culture in a way that you just don't see uh, to the same extent, at least in other countries. Uh, so we really have this heavy focus on personal autonomy as opposed to like collective good, right? Um, if you look at our popular culture as a country, you see the same thing, right? From John Wayne Westerns in the 20th century to the social media influencers of today, we in the U.S. tend to celebrate and even venerate individualism and freedom over collectivism, right? Now, on a more practical level, America's skepticism about mandatory national service is pretty clearly rooted in, in one major case where we've implemented it on a mass scale, and that is the military draft. Uh, the United States has used military conscription, commonly known as the draft, in six different conflicts in its history, starting with the Revolutionary War and ending most recently with the Vietnam War. And while the draft ended in 1973, at least for now, it's still viewed negatively by many Americans. Of the roughly 55,000 Americans killed in Vietnam, for example, almost 18,000 or 30 percent were draftees, meaning that they didn't volunteer to be there. They were conscripted into national service, in this case, a war on the other side of the world. And if you want to go even deeper than that, you could make the argument that many Americans are skeptical of mandatory service because of our country's history with slavery. Obviously, mandatory service isn't the same thing as slavery. That's not an argument we should be making in the round. They're not the same thing. It isn't based on race or presumably on any other status. It isn't permanent. It doesn't make you another person's property. But in a broader sense, many Americans are perhaps justifiably opposed to the country ever going back down the road of forced labor for any anyone for any reason, no matter how beneficial it might seem. And as we'll talk about later, there's even a question as to whether mandatory service would violate the 13th Amendment, which outlawed slavery and involuntary servitude after the Civil War. Now, having said all that, the United States does have a pretty robust history of voluntary, that is to say, non-mandatory national service programs in its recent history. In the 1930s, you had New Deal programs like the Civilian Conservation Corps, which employed young men during rural conservation work, improving national parks, planting trees, and other similar work. In the 1960s, you had John F. Kennedy founding the Peace Corps, which to this day sends volunteers abroad to do international development aid work. And a few years later, Lyndon Johnson founded Vista, which was essentially a domestic counterpart to the Peace Corps. And in the 1990s, Bill Clinton established AmeriCorps, which encompasses Vista and other similar programs, sending volunteers to do anti-poverty and community development work around the United States. And we will drop some links in the notes below with descriptions of these programs. And I would recommend that you take some time to read up on them. Obviously, Obviously, this resolution isn't talking about these specific voluntary programs, but they do provide models for what hypothetical civilian national service programs might look like, which would give the AF in particular some help in explaining to the judge exactly what the affirmative world looks like, what happens if you vote for this. And
And that's an important thing to be able to do in debate. You'll also want to look at examples from other countries implementing national service obligations and a sense of how those have worked, good or bad. In most cases, it's going to be some form of national military service, like the kind you see in places like Israel, uh, North and South Korea, and Russia. All of these programs are different, but they typically have a few similar features, as you can see in this article that we'll link to from Outlook India. First, mandatory service is usually for a limited period of time. For example, Russian military service lasts one year for most people. For South Korea, it's two years, and in Israel, it's two years and six months for men and two years for women, which raises a second, uh, slightly more controversial point, which is that in places where national service is focused on the military, it's usually limited to men. Israel is the exception, and you do see some countries like North Korea selectively conscripting women but for the most part, it's men only. And of course, if the U.S. were to implement uh, mandatory service with a civilian option, I think we can safely assume it would be for all people, regardless of gender. But that's not absolutely certain, because as we'll talk about in just a minute, the U.S. currently requires men and only men to register for selective service when they turn 18. And speaking of turning 18, that is the third common feature of most national service requirements, which is that they apply to relatively young people. Most mandatory service programs start around 18 and typically have to be completed before 30. Uh, there is a really interesting side note, which is that in 2021, the South Korean parliament passed a law allowing K-pop stars to delay their mandatory service until they turn 30, because as we all know, uh, being 30 in K-pop is basically like the retirement age. Um, examples of mandatory civilian service are much more rare. There are some examples of proposals, like one in France that would require civilian service for all 16-year-olds, which apparently has like been on the drawing board and close to implementation since 2019, but as of this video in 2023, it does not appear that it's actually been rolled out. So what that means is, unless you as the app want to run a case that is exclusively about military service, which I don't recommend, uh, you're going to have to acknowledge that there really isn't a clear, obvious model out there in any other country for us to model this after. Instead, you have to look to things like voluntary U.S. service programs like Visa and AmeriCorps, but also the proposals that advocates have put forward for what these programs might look like that are out there in the literature. And luckily, there are a lot of them, and we will link to them. So just a couple of examples. Uh, this comes from Professor Liliana Mason from the University of Maryland in 2019, and you can see the quote here that we'll put up on the screen. Uh, but it basically says that, you know, the proposal here that she gets from Stanley McChrystal, a retired Army general says that this should be universal or quasi-mandatory. It should be paid. It should be a gap year, basically when you graduate from high school, sending you away from home to work on projects to improve communities like infrastructure, working in a food bank or a clinic or something like that. That's a pretty simple explanation of what it might look like. There has been some proposed legislation, like for example, the Universal National Service Act of 2006, which was proposed by Representative Charlie Rangel, but never passed into law. And what this would do, if it had passed, would have been to require a period of military service or civilian service uh, in furtherance of national defense and homeland security for all men and women. But anyway, I think the bottom line things to know here are, number one, the U.S. is very uh, individual rights focused in terms of how it approaches its culture uh, because it had a bad experience with the military draft. So there's some natural skepticism toward uh, mandatory service. However, number two, there are plenty of examples of large federal initiatives like Vista and AmeriCorps that give us an idea of what national service might look like. Number three, most international examples come in the form of military conscription, which I don't think you want to limit your case to as the affirmative. You wanna be broader and have both a civilian and a military option. And number four, there are plenty of proposals out there from advocacy groups and think tanks that you can point to as models for what mandatory national service might look like. So with that, that's a very brief factual overview. Let's move on and talk about some strategic definitions for the terms in the resolution. Okay, so now let's take a look at the actual words in the resolution. Now, if you're brand new to debate, and most of you probably are, one of the first things that you'll learn is that most debaters typically read definitions of key terms near the beginning of their case. A lot of newer debaters just sort of read definitions because they know that's the tradition. It's something they know that they're supposed to do, but they don't really think about the strategic reasons why these definitions are important. So let me see if I can explain it as simply as I can. The resolution is a specific proposition. 
To win, the affirmative has to prove that the proposition is true, while the negative wins by preventing the affirmative from doing that. Now, in some ways, you might think of the resolution uh, like the goal line in football. If the offense, the affirmative, gets over the line, they get six points. Uh, but if they get stopped short of the goal line by the defense, the negative, even if they get really close, even if they get like one inch away, they still get zero points. Now, unlike football in debate, we get to try to persuade the judge where that goal line is. And we do this by making arguments about exactly what the terms in the resolution mean and what the resolution requires. And we typically do that through definitions and also sometimes through what we call framing and theory arguments, which we'll talk about in subsequent videos, but we're really not gonna focus on too much today. For now, we'll focus on definitions. So let, let me give you a hypothetical example. Imagine we're debating the resolution, Barbie is better than Oppenheimer, since those are the two blockbuster movies that are squaring off against each other while we're making this video. The meaning of the word better is gonna dramatically affect where the goal line is and what the two sides have to prove, right? So if the affirmative can persuade the judge that better just means more commercially successful or more profitable, well, that's gonna be a really easy win for the affirmative because Barbie has, in fact, made more money than Oppenheimer. And that means the negative had better be ready to push back and offer a different definition of what the word better means. Maybe one focusing on critical reviews or historical importance or educational value. And if the negative does that, we can expect part of the debate overall in the round to be the two sides trying to persuade the judge what it means to be a better movie. In other words, debating about definitions, which is just a part of debate. So definitions can be extremely important on certain topics. Now, to be clear, you don't want to be a debater who tries to use gimmick definitions or squirrely definitions to like ambush your opponent. Those people are annoying to compete against, but they rarely win consistently. What you do want to do is think critically about how you define terms and try to find definitions that, while fair and reasonable, give you a little bit of a tactical edge or make your burden a little bit lower. To go back to our football analogy, if you're the AF, you want to look for definitions that move the goal line closer to you, and if you're the NEG, you want to look for definitions that move it a little farther away, all while being fair. So let's start by looking at the definitions in this particular topic. With with the term the United States. Uh, now this pretty clearly refers to the United States of America and you're probably thinking, Brett, that is so obvious that like, why would you even mention it? And in most cases I would say you're probably right, it's not gonna be an issue. But I wanted to mention it very briefly uh, that because even obvious terms that you see sometimes are still worth paying attention to when you do your definitions, if only to be prepared for what other debaters might do. For example, uh, over the years I have on just a few occasions uh, seen debaters defining the United States as the United States of Mexico and then running a case about whatever the resolution is discussing but in Mexico and catching their opponent off guard. Now let me be clear, this is almost certainly not going to happen with novice debaters on this topic, so please don't worry about it and, and don't ever, of course, do this yourself. Good debaters use strategic definitions. They don't do abusive or intellectually dishonest stuff. But I mentioned this kind of weird occurrence, right? Because as you start preparing on any topic you encounter in your career, it pays to think very carefully and very critically about each and every word in the resolution. Because even though this resolution is pretty straightforward, many will not be. Many will contain terms where a different definition or a different way of framing the issue can significantly change the burdens, making it either easier or harder for you. So if you get used to asking yourself questions like, hmm, is there anything an opponent could do with this specific word or this term to kind of cheat on the topic or to make it more difficult for me, that's going to be a very good habit to get into on resolutions where the definitions really do matter a lot. So be sure you're carefully scrutinizing every single word on the resolution so that you can both, one, uh, prepare for opponents who might use squirrely definitions against you, but also, two, use some fair but strategic definitions of your own. But anyway, United States means United States of America. So now let's look at some terms where the definition actually is a little bit more debatable. And the first one is, of course, national service. So this is a term where the definition may be a lot more controversial and you need to be prepared to defend your position. If you go to Google and look up definitions for national service, you're gonna find definitions that focus on military service. So for example, the Cambridge Dictionary defines national service as, quote, the system in some countries by which young people, especially men, are ordered by law to spend a period of time in the armed services. Collins Dictionary says national service is service in the armed forces, 
uh, which young people in certain countries have to do by law. Now, if you apply a definition like this, the AF is going to have an extremely heavy burden. Essentially, they'll have to advocate for something similar to like an Israeli or Russian style system of mandatory military conscription, which would have every American, presumably like under a certain age, serving in a certain period of time in the army or the navy or some other branch of the armed forces. This would be, frankly, an exceptionally tough sell for the affirmative for a lot of reasons, which we will talk about later. But briefly, the, the truth is the United States just doesn't need millions of short-term conscripts. We have an all-professional volunteer army that is increasingly more dependent on like high-tech weapons than on like masses of inexperienced, hastily trained soldiers. Luckily for the app, I don't think this is what NSDA meant when it used the term national service. And more fortunately than that, there are alternative, I think, better definitions that you can use. For example, in a 2019 report called Will America Embrace National Service, the Brookings Institution quoted Charles Moscos defining national service as, quote, the full-time undertaking of public duties by citizen soldiers or civilian servers who are paid subsistence wages. This definition is much better for the affirmative because it doesn't limit national service to the military, but instead includes civilian service like AmeriCorps and similar programs. Also, let's pause for a second and note where this definition comes from. It's not just from a dictionary. It's from a report by a credible public policy think tank, the Brookings Institution, about the specific issue of national service in the United States. You might ask yourself, why does this matter? Why does the source of a definition or any other information or argument that you read in the round matter? Well, it basically comes down to credibility and relevance. Like we said earlier, sometimes in debate rounds, the two sides will have conflicting definitions and which one the judge applies can mean the difference between who wins and loses. There are a lot of ways to argue uh, in defense of your definition, but one of the most common is to point out that it comes from a more credible source. So here, if you were on the affirmative trying to persuade the judge that national service means this broad array of military and civilian service, and your opponent just cited a dictionary definition, you would be able to say, look, judge, my opponent's definition is just from some dictionary. Mine is from a respected think tank addressing the specific question in this resolution. In other words, my definition from Brookings is what experts are talking about on this topic in the real world, in real world debates. So you should apply it here because it'll make for a more educational, realistic round, right? And as you go forth on future topics, just remember, if a term in the resolution is something that you expect you may have to fight over, finding a definition from an expert scholarly source talking about the real world issue is going to give you an advantage over folks who just use basic dictionary definitions. Sometimes dictionary definitions are fine, but if you expect to have to fight over it, scholarly sources are usually better. Ultimately, if you are on the negative, you can certainly try running a definition that is limited to military service, but just understand that there's a good chance that many judges will reject that interpretation. And that is why I suggest that both sides use something like the Brookings Institution definition that encompasses both military and civilian service. There are plenty of strong arguments for and against a broad version of national service like this, and you run less of a risk on either side, AF or NEG, of betting the entire round on a single kind of risky definition. Definition. So that's national service. Now let's talk about the key modifier term in the resolution, which is mandatory. Mandatory is another term where it's important for both sides to think clearly about the implications that wording has on their burdens. If you read some of the articles and proposals for so-called mandatory national service out there, you'll find that a lot of them are playing kind of fast and loose with what the word mandatory means. For example, there's this article by David Haynes in 2023 that says it's about uh, mandatory national service, but then it proposes encouraging national service by, quote, giving public service credit and enhanced higher education assistance and enrolling in the U.S. Peace Corps, Teach America, and other similar national type organizations. Well, I don't know about you, but when I hear somebody say that we're going to encourage a given behavior by giving out like somewhat greater benefits, that doesn't sound like mandatory behavior. It sounds like optional but encouraged behavior. Basically, if the teacher says, if you don't do this assignment, you fail the class, well, that's mandatory. But if the teacher just says, do this assignment and you get some extra credit, I think we would all agree that's not what the word mandatory means. 
So in short, it's very important to be mindful, especially in debating on the negative of exactly what the consequences are for not doing the service in the affirmative world. Some affirmatives may try to dodge some of the downsides of national service by pointing to potential ways that people can get out of it. And if they do that, if they make it too easy to get out of it, they run the risk of being what we call non-topical. Now, this is another debate concept that we should pause and explain. When we say that a case is topical, what we mean is that it addresses what the resolution says rather than talking about something else. Being topical is generally seen by most judges as a strict requirement for the affirmative to win. So, for example, if the resolution said kids should listen to classical music, and I, as the affirmative, got up and read a case about how great it is when kids listen to Taylor Swift and how you should listen to Taylor Swift, that wouldn't be topical because Taylor Swift is not classical music. I mean, not yet. I'm sure in a couple hundred years she will be considered that, but she's not yet. Um, and consequently, the affirmative would probably lose that debate because they were advocating for something different than what the resolution calls for. In other words, they are what we would call non-topical. So when you hear words like topicality and non-topical in debate, that's just referring to the requirement that the affirmative side has to advocate for something that falls within the wording of the resolution. And this is a really important requirement because if you're the AF and you're not topical, you generally lose the round. Anyway, on this topic, the resolution requires that service be mandatory. So if we're going to be topical and not lose the round, we need to look for some definitions of what mandatory means. Uh, so Webster defines it as required by a law or rule. The Cambridge Dictionary defines it as something that must be done or is demanded by law. And the Collins Dictionary says mandatory means authoritatively ordered or obligatory. So it's pretty clear that an action that is mandatory is required and not optional. That seems to imply, though, that there has to be some kind of penalty if we don't do it, not just like a bonus if we do. So what would that penalty look like? Well, even though we don't currently have a military draft in the United States, the U.S. still requires males turning 18 to register for selective service, like we said earlier. And if you fail to do that, it's actually a felony that can result in a fine of up to $250,000 and five years in prison. The penalty for whatever form of national service the AF chooses doesn't have to be that severe, but I would argue that to be truly mandatory, it does have to involve some kind of loss of rights or privileges, maybe a fine, maybe ineligibility to vote, maybe losing federal benefits like Pell Grants or something. But ultimately, I think the AF side needs to be able to explain in some level, if asked, what happens to people who don't do this? Why is it truly mandatory? Lastly, let's take a look at the word ought. This is another pretty simple term. Ought just means that you as the actor should do something. For example, Cambridge Dictionary says ought is used to say that it is necessary or desirable to perform an action. So the resolution is just saying the United States should impose some kind of mandatory national service requirement. Now, every once in a while, debaters even try to get clever with words like ought and use overly philosophical and complicated definitions. They may try to give uh, complicated interpretations, but that is rarely a winning strategy. Now, we may delve into some of that in future videos. We've talked about it in other videos in the past, but for now, I think the simplest approach here is the best approach. Ought means should. So what we're debating about here is whether the U.S. should have a mandatory national service requirement, not whether it likely will, but whether it should. And so those are the key terms. Uh, we just spent a fair time on them, but don't obsess too much about definitions as you start out in LD. Just make sure that as you write your case, you're thinking strategically about what the words mean, including solid definitions of the major terms in both of your cases, and then moving on to the substantive arguments. And so with that, let us move on and talk a little bit about values and criteria. Okay, so let's start by talking for just a minute about what values and criteria are and what they do in Lincoln-Douglas debate. This is important because a lot of fairly experienced debaters tend to treat these two parts of the case as kind of a throwaway, something that they are required to say in the round, but they don't really know why. And more specifically, they don't seem to know what role the value and criterion play in the logical step-by-step -step argument for why you win the round. And right now is a perfect time for you to learn these things because being a brand new debater, you haven't had time to develop these bad habits yet. And you can start your career using the value and the criterion in the correct way and also in the way that's gonna be most likely to help you win the round. So what is a value? 
Well, Lincoln-Douglas debate was created in the 1980s as an alternative to the, what was then the only form of debate, which was policy debate. And the thing that was supposed to make LD different from policy debate was that it was considered value debate. Instead of being about specific policy proposals, it was about these more general questions of like what is good and bad, what is right and wrong, and so on. That distinction has evolved a little bit over the years, but in most places, most judges still expect LD debaters to talk generally about the rightness or wrongness of the resolution. In other words, to talk about general values. So the question is, how do we decide what to value? What is good or bad, right or wrong, desirable or undesirable? And the answer is that we usually try to link the specific thing that we're arguing about to some broader principle that we can all agree is good. So let me give you an example. Say you're suggesting to your family, we should eat at home instead of going out for fast food. And the question would be, why? And you might say, well, we have healthier food at home. So if we stay at home and eat, as a general rule, we will live longer, healthier lives. And that might be the argument you make. The response would be, okay, but why does that matter? Uh, and, and this is where you get to the ultimate value that you're proposing. And you say something like, well, human beings can only experience happiness if they're alive and they experience more happiness if they are healthy. So my argument to my family, at least on this issue, is that the most important thing that we should shoot for, in other words, the value, right, should be longer, healthier lives. And that is what the value is in LD debate. It is a general concept that we can all agree is good, and it represents like a valid end goal in our moral decision makings. In other words, it's the North Star that we use to chart our course. It is the ultimate moral destination where we're basically saying, look, if I can achieve this thing, judge, whatever it is, or if I can achieve it better than my opponent, then I have earned the right to win this debate round. So if the value is supposed to be the thing that we can all agree on that is desirable, the end goal, that suggests that it should probably be something that's pretty universally regarded as good, not something that's terribly controversial. And that's why I generally recommend one of two stock values for most debate cases, and those are justice and morality. And of course, there are countless different ways to think about what justice and morality mean and what they entail, but let's just talk about them generally for a second and think about how they apply to this topic. So broadly speaking, justice tends to be about giving people what they deserve under the circumstances. The Cambridge Dictionary defines justice as fairness in the way people are dealt with. In other words, based on a person's conduct and their situation, we think they are entitled to, say, a certain benefit or that they deserve a certain consequence. Meanwhile, morality is defined by Webster as conformity to ideals of right human conduct. In other words, if justice is about like what a person is entitled to receive, morality is more about like what we can expect from them. For an individual, we might ask, how do we expect them to conduct themselves toward other people? For a government, we might ask, what do we expect it to do or provide for its people or interact with other governments or something like that? Now, now let me ask you a question. Think about this. Based on those two definitions of morality and justice, which one do you think would be a better fit for the affirmative on this resolution, saying that national service ought to be mandatory? And if you want to pause for just a second and think it through, feel free to do that, because it is really important as you start debate that you start doing the critical thinking for yourself. So I'll just give you a second. Okay, are you back? Uh, did you even leave in the first place? So what do you think, right? Is it morality or is it justice for the affirmative? Well, you could certainly make an argument for either one, but since national service is generally asking people to take on a burden for the greater good of society, I think I would argue that maybe morality would be a better fit for the affirmative. In other words, the moral thing for people to do is to devote a certain portion of their time to serving the country. And on the negative, you might argue that a person who has done nothing wrong shouldn't be forced into labor against their will. They've done nothing to deserve this burden, so maybe it's unjust, maybe it violates justice to make them carry it. So maybe justice would be a better value for the negative. Now, that's just sort of gaming through one line of argumentation. There are absolutely ways where you could switch those two values around, make a case work very well. And there are plenty of other values, if that's what you want to do, that you could use here. For example, if you wanted to argue about using national service to even out outcomes between the rich and the poor, you might choose a value like equality or equity or something like that. But no matter what value you choose, one problem that they all have when they stand on their own is that they tend to be really subjective and vague. 
So you have to make your value more concrete. And how exactly do you do that? How do, exactly do you show what it means in practical terms to do something that is just or do something that is moral? And the answer in LD is the criterion. Criterion is just the singular of the word criteria. And, and criteria just means a set of standards. So when you give your judge your criterion, you're really just giving them a standard, a measuring stick that they can use to determine which side better upholds the value. And because the criterion is supposed to provide this measuring stick, it's going to need to be more specific and detailed than the value. And it's also going to need to tie directly into the contentions that you're going to be making later in your case. The criterion is basically going to say to the judge, look, judge, here is a specific test for justice, morality, or whatever. In a second, I'm going to give you some arguments about why my side meets that test better than the other side. And if I do that, if I give you a value, give you a test, and show you why I meet the test, I should win the round. Right Now, not surprisingly, many of the most frequently used criteria in LD come from the world of moral and ethical philosophy. They're usually uh, theories or formulations from philosophers about what it means to be good or just or moral or what have you. So if you want to get good at writing cases in LD, you do have to spend some time reading up on moral philosophy and thinking on your own about how it works. And we'll actually post some links in the notes below for places you can go to get started on that. But for now, let's talk about some specific philosophical concepts that might make for good criteria on the national service topic. On the affirmative, one of the simplest standards you can apply to almost any resolution is some version of utilitarianism. Utilitarianism, sometimes also called consequentialism is basically just the idea that we should decide what action or policy is best or is moral based on the consequences or the outcomes that it produces. So whereas maybe a devoutly religious person might judge morality by whether it comports with their religious teachings, a utilitarian would judge morality by whether the action creates the greatest happiness or avoids the greatest suffering for the greatest number of people. Some of the key philosophers in the utilitarian tradition are people like uh, British philosophers Jeremy Bentham and John Stuart Mill, both of whom argued that the chief aim of moral action is maximizing pleasure and minimizing pain of human beings. So how would we apply this utilitarian theory to the national service topic? Well, it's pretty straightforward. The affirmative could devote most of their contentions to arguing about all of the practical benefits of national service, the projects that it could do, the infrastructure that it could build, the sense of national unity that it could foster, and so on. And the AF could argue that all of these benefits enhance happiness of people in society while causing little or no major suffering. So the AF would argue a national service requirement enhances social happiness meaning that it meets the requirements of utilitarianism and thus upholds morality. Once again, here are some arguments that meet a test that achieve a value, right? That's the basic structure of the LD case. Here's the value I seek to uphold. Here's the criterion you use to test whether I achieve it. Here are the contentions that show you why I meet the test. Now, of course, there are countless other criteria you could use on the affirmative. Just to cite a few examples, uh, there's a theory called Rawlsian justice. Rawlsian justice comes from the 20th century American political theorist John Rawls. Rawls says that we can only determine what is just if we don't know our specific place in society. In other words, if we don't know if we're rich or poor, male or female, able-bodied or disabled, and so on. Because if we know our position, we will inherently be biased in favor of whatever groups we're in, right? Based on that presumption, Rawls says that to be fair, we have to make our decisions behind this imaginary thing called the veil of ignorance, where we don't know our place in society. And behind that veil, we would rationally choose policies that help the least advantaged, because the least advantaged will suffer the most from bad policies, but have the most to gain from good policies. And that's really the takeaway, helping the least advantaged. So if the AF wanted to use Rawlsian justice as the criterion here, they could argue that mandatory service will allow for all sorts of new programs and initiatives aimed at helping economically depressed places, less advantaged people, similar to programs like AmeriCorps, or Habitat for Humanity, and so on. And it would also provide work and training programs to disadvantaged people. It might lead to long-term employment. So even if mandatory service wouldn't be great for already wealthy people, as long as it's helping the least advantaged, we should support it. Lastly, for the app, another possibility would be things like communitarian theories of morality. Uh, communitarianism is a philosophical school that emphasizes like the connected nature of individuals and communities. Uh, one good example of it comes from the French sociologist Emile Durkheim, who wrote about the importance of social integration. Durkheim believed that social relationships between people 
play a powerful role in shaping their norms, beliefs, and values. Uh, as the importance of like your extended family and small, tight-knit communities diminished with social mobility, people moving around and living farther apart, Durkheim believed it was critical to have institutions that instilled a sense of common identity and mutual respect in people, even though they might live thousands of miles apart uh, and lead very different lives. Without this sense of social cohesion, uh, you see adverse impacts uh, like everything from uh, mental and physical health to crime to political stability and things like that. Uh, the argument here would be that mandatory national service helps create this institutional sense of national cohesion, shared purpose, social integration, and without these things, we see society start to come apart at the seams, which is kind of what we're seeing with polarization in the United States right now. Now, shifting gears, on the negative side, there are also some really strong options for the criteria. Just like on the affirmative, one option is utilitarianism. Uh, the negatives argument here would be that any benefits that you can get from mandatory national service, you can also get from voluntary programs, but without a lot of the downsides. So, for example, if the benefits of national service include like building infrastructure, fighting poverty, well, you can accomplish that by paying people to voluntarily do the work or providing other incentives like money for college. And by incentivizing service, rather than making it mandatory, you avoid a lot of the downsides like infringing on rights, resentment, political backlash and manipulation, and also unequal impact on marginalized groups who may not want to participate uh, at all. Another option for the negative would be some kind of libertarianism, which is basically the belief that protection of individual freedoms is the chief aim of government. Uh, philosophers like Robert Nozick argue that every individual has an inherent, some would say natural, right to pursue whatever their version is of a good life as long as they're not preventing other people from doing the same thing. But when we decide that person A has a right to demand some positive action from person B, like for example, demanding their labor on some project as part of a national service requirement, we are forcing the involuntary sacrifice of person B's interests to benefit person A. This denies person B their fundamental autonomy as a human being. In short, as humans, we are not a means to an end. We are not ants in a colony who exist to die for the queen. We are not pawns on a chessboard. We are the ends. Our autonomy and our freedom is the goal. And so to libertarians like Nozick, government saying, especially outside of an emergency context like a war, hey, we want to force you to give us your labor and your time in support of our ideas of the collective good. And also, by the way, this is for your own good. It'll teach you about common purposes and so on. That is abhorrent to them. It's treating a human being like they are a tool and destroying their freedom to choose. And we reject it as a moral matter right up front. We don't even ask what the effects will be. We reject it because it is intrinsically, by definition, wrong. And that's a really quick rundown of what values and criteria are and some basic ideas on how you can use them in your case. But whatever you do, don't forget that the value and the criterion are the end goal and the measuring stick of your case. So if you decide to run a negative case, let's just say using Robert Nozick's theories of libertarianism, you can't just turn around and throw a bunch of random contentions in about say like the cost of the program being too high or the disparate impact on social groups. Whatever you say the criterion is, the contentions in your case need to match up to that. So if your criterion is about libertarianism, if you say measure the round based on whether it preserves individual rights, then your contention need to focus heavily, maybe not exclusively, but heavily on preserving individual rights. That is the logical syllogism that you have set up and you need to follow that. And if your opponent fails to do that, and by the way, as a novice, many of your opponents will completely fail to do that. Their, their syllogisms will fall completely apart. You need to learn to listen critically and ask, wait, how do these contentions uphold this criterion? How do they lead to this value? Many novices fail to understand that the contentions, the criterion, and the value tell a logical sequential story. They are a logical chain. A lot of novices just throw in random, individually kind of strong arguments that don't connect to the rest of the story. So if you hear a case and the parts don't connect up, ask them, how does your first contention meet your criterion? How are they related?
And if your opponent doesn't have a good answer, you need to learn to tell the judge, look, she gave you a criterion. A criterion is a measuring stick. It's a test to see if she achieves the value. She never explained how any of her contentions are related to that test, that criterion. So the logical syllogism of her case falls apart on its own without me ever having to refute any of the specific parts. I would be amazed if at your first tournament as a novice, you didn't have at least one or two rounds where that was a very valid attack on many novice debates. And on that point, I think it is a good time to transition to the part that a lot of you have been waiting for, which is, in fact, the substantive arguments. That is the potential contentions on the affirmative and then on the negative. So on the affirmative, let's start with some of the broader arguments and then kind of narrow things down as we go. Uh, as a practical matter in the real world literature that you see, on mandatory national service, the central argument in favor that you see in most of the pieces is that it promotes national unity. Now, the argument here is basically that American society is becoming increasingly fragmented. Uh, politically, the left and right are extremely far apart. Wealth gaps are growing. Polls show increasing racial polarization. You can even find polls that show Americans distrust and actively dislike people who disagree with them more than they ever have before. Uh, mandatory national service is seen as a way to instill a sense of common purpose, shared experience, and like dialogue between people who normally wouldn't interact. To pull people out of their bubbles and their echo chambers and to essentially force them into a sense of national unity at a very young age. So, for example, you have this from John M. Bridgeland uh, and John Dulio of the Brookings Institution. Uh, as you can see here, it says, as the pluribus and e pluribus unum becomes even more diverse, we need to create a greater sense of we. America needs to build civic bridges that span our nation's demographic divides and socioeconomic fault lines. One powerful idea is national service, and it talks about how it will bring people from different backgrounds and income levels, races, and ethnicities together early in life uh, and create leaders who can get things done. Well, that's a really nice idea. That's some good language you can use in your case, but does it work in practice? Well, it turns out uh, there is some empirical evidence, and I have this listed as empirical evidence shows mandatory service increases tolerance. I think this is really important for the affirmative if you're going to run a national unity argument. You have to be able to prove that mandatory service does actually increase uh, a sense of cohesion and unity, and it's not just like a pipe dream or a hope. So to do that, we have this from our Ronan Itzik on um, the Security and Defense Quarterly in 2020. And what you see here is the current research, and this is research about uh, conscription into the Israeli armed forces. Current research studied changes in social attitudes during compulsory military service in Israel, where society is considered to be essentially divided around ethnic and national issues. Uh, it's based on the attitudes of 3,200 individual folks. And as you can see here in the quote, what it finds is that someone who is discharged from this service uh, tend to be more tolerant than high school students. The high school students are the control group, the people who've been through their military service or the study group. And we find that the folks who've been through this mandatory national military service are more tolerant of other cultures and people of different ethnic origins. So what they find is that is an effective means of social integration. There are even more concrete impacts in the literature though. Uh, the next point I have is empirical evidence shows that mandatory service reduces criminal behavior. This comes from Nicolette Rose of Old Dominion University in 2014. And basically what she says is that mandatory military service, as well as mandatory social service as an additional option, negatively correlate with uh, criminal behavior. Um, the idea here is that when we give young people a sense of shared purpose and shared identity, they're less likely to engage in clearly antisocial behavior like crime. The study applies uh, Durkheim's theory of social integration, which we talked about earlier. And this is a really good example of the point we made earlier of how your substantive arguments need to tie into your framework. So if your AF case is about social cohesion, this evidence is really good to show that mandatory national service is actually effective at encouraging social cohesion and discouraging antisocial behavior. The next point that I have is a mandate is necessary to achieve unity. This is the same article from Professor Liliana Mason we mentioned a second ago where she talks about proposals for mandatory service and says this about why they need to be mandatory. Importantly, all of these young people in this hypothetical program she's talking about would travel to an unfamiliar location so that their status as strangers was equalized. A voluntary program would be less effective. It would allow those who prefer to sit in partisan isolation to continue to do so. 
Now, this is a nice common sense framing of the argument, but there's also some statistical evidence out there that suggests that when people engage in service on a purely voluntary basis, they tend to fall into some pretty narrow statistical groups. For example, a Pew Research Center study from 2019 found that people volunteering for local community organizations are more likely to have higher incomes, and we will link to that. There's also this article from Professor Leslie Hustinks of Ghent University uh, in 2022, and this is summarizing research on why like socially dominant privileged groups tend to be the ones who volunteer more. And as you can see here, what she does is just summarize the research, which finds some pretty robust evidence that socially dominant groups, socially privileged groups, tend to be the ones engaging in most volunteer work. In other words, the academic literature overwhelmingly shows that these wealthier people, people from non-marginalized racial groups and so on, tend to do the most volunteering, which means that volunteer service in the status quo is going to be a bad way to foster national unity because it's going to tend to bring together people who already are together in these socially dominant groups as opposed to people from a broad cross-section of society. Now, the next point I have is kind of a preemptive answer to common uh, negative arguments that we'll talk about in a second, and it is that social cohesion should trump absolute freedom. Basically, the idea here is to anticipate the negatives argument that mandatory national service will take away your complete and total freedom to pursue your own interests. And it sort of turns that argument back on the negative, arguing not only is that not a problem, it's actually a good thing because it teaches people to put collective good and respect for others ahead of their own narrow ambitions. So to do that, we first, uh, again, looked at the piece by Nicolette Rose from Old Dominion in 2014. She's talking about Durkheim and the need for social cohesion, and she writes, for Durkheim, the moral order was more fundamental than the economic order. Everything which is a source of solidarity is moral. Everything which forces man to take account of other men is moral. Everything which forces him to regulate his conduct through something other than the striving of his ego is moral, and morality is as solid as these ties are numerous and strong. The same point was made in more practical terms by Professor Richard Weisbord and Senator Chris Murphy this year in 2023, uh, and what they say is, in America today, far too many of us are disconnected from each other, lonely, self-protective, or at each other's throats, sacrificing personal gain for the common good, or treating people with different views respectfully, or prioritizing collective success over individual success. It's all for suckers. And then down at the bottom of the quote, expanding national service programs would help address this challenge, bringing young people together from various backgrounds to work on common causes, creating ties across the usual divides, and strengthening young people's commitment to their country. So the argument here would be, let's say that mandatory national service does deprive a young person of, say, a year of higher income, or maybe it does cost taxpayers a fair amount of money. And we'll talk later about why it actually doesn't cost money on net. Or maybe it does infringe on some idea of ultimate liberty. The AF would say it's worth the price. In fact, the AF would say the price of giving up liberty is actually part of the benefit because it teaches young adults that they're part of something bigger than themselves, which in turn makes them more tolerant, less likely to break the law, less likely to be politically polarized, and so on. And even if that's the only thing that national mandatory service accomplishes, the app might say, even if we didn't build any houses or any bridges, or if we didn't clean up any parks or teach any children, that lesson in and of itself, that you are part of something bigger than you and that you share a purpose with others, is worth it because as Weisbord and Murphy and many, many others explain, it helps stop the current trend of America splitting into these disconnected, self-interested subsections, which threatens our very existence as a country. So we We've talked a lot about the values like unity and common purpose. Let's shift gears now and focus on some of the practical benefits that national service could yield. And we start off with physical and civic infrastructure. And on this, we can look to Jesse Colvin on the Independent Sector blog in 2020. And what it says is America's civic infrastructure is the foundation on which our country was built. Nonprofit organizations are the institutions driving change in local communities. They are providing much needed human capital and volunteers in response to the growing number of natural, natural disasters taking place across the country. And they're the engines running our food banks and providing extra support to our schools and teachers during unprecedented and challenging times. In order to be successful, nonprofits need strong, sustained capacity. 
Rigorous independent evaluations have demonstrated that national service programs help nonprofits build their capacity in different areas, including volunteer management, leadership, fiscal management, fund development, evaluation, learning capacity, collaboration, communications, and technology. And he basically says national service has the potential to rebuild America's civic infrastructure at a time when our country is dependent on nonprofits and community organizations to quickly address its worst crises. Looking to the broader economic impacts of national service, there's some very good evidence, and I have this labeled as national service is a net positive economic generator. The argument here is basically that national service would be a net economic benefit or a generator. In other words, it would produce significantly more overall economic benefits for the country than it would cost. This is sort of your classic utilitarian benefits outweigh the cost type of argument. Uh, this was a big rationale, by the way, for work programs like the Civilian Conservation Corps during the Depression. That is, they would provide economic stimulus and get the economy going and put people to work in addition to whatever actual projects that they completed. So on this, we look to Clive Belfield of Columbia University in 2013 in a piece called The Economic Value of National Service. So you can see in the first section here, he talks about how we have about 125,000 individuals or the equivalent of 125,000 individuals at a cost somewhere between 1.4 and 2.0 billion dollars to the country or to taxpayers. But then if you look in the second section of the quote, what you see is that the net economic benefits are roughly 6.5 billion. So if you even take high estimates as to what the cost is, you're getting a return on investment. You're, you're getting a lot more economic net value created by these national service programs, 3.95 times greater. So in other words, there's a massive positive return on investment that we're getting from these programs. And presumably you would argue that if we were to expand them uh, to a mandatory program as opposed to an optional one, we would see that net benefit go up. Maybe not go up in a linear fashion by a specific multiple, but probably go up uh, to a higher number. So when uh, the negative talks about the cost, this is a great preemptive response to say whatever the cost is, it's outweighed tremendously by the benefits, the economic benefits and other benefits that it produces for society. Um, lastly, on this point, uh, there's this piece from Stephen Cohen in The Hill in 2020 about national service being affordable. And he talks here about how even if you have sort of high end estimates, $5,000 per person and then $5,000 in pay, um, that we say put into a bank account or something, uh, that might lead to a total price tag of $40 billion a year, which is a lot. But he says when you compare that to what we spend on other programs in the United States, you know, like for example, we spend $600 billion on the military, $1.3 trillion on Social Security, it's not an unmanageable cost. It's not a cost that is out of proportion with other major government programs. So if you have the negative saying it's going to be some just massive expenditure that we can't afford, no, we spend many, many times this already on the military, on Social Security, on other expenditures. So it's not an out of proportion cost. Last but not least uh, of the major topics on the app, we should talk about how mandatory national service is actually a pretty mainstream idea and not some fringe radical proposal. I have this labeled as uh, national service is consistent with U.S. values and history. So like we said earlier, and as we'll talk about in a second on the negative, the United States is a fiercely individualistic country, and we can expect opponents of national service to paint it as being like wildly out of step with our traditions and as something that's just fundamentally at odds with American values. So to preempt that, uh, we have this piece from, again, from Bridgeland and Diulio in 2019. And what it basically says is that um, national service is consistent with American civic tradition, a tradition bestowing rights along with corresponding duties all the way back to the founding fathers. And it talks about the progressive era, the New Deal, uh, right up to JFK uh, with the famous question, ask not what your country can do for you, but what you can do for your country. Although our present national moment might be an exception, throughout our history, most presidents and other national leaders in both parties have spoken such pro-national service rhetoric, expressed related civic sentiments, and generally supported and celebrated both public and private efforts to translate the words, these words and feelings into actions and initiatives. And it talks about things like the Civilian Conservation Corps, the Freedom Corps, and other things. And so this is just an idea of trying to connect it to the larger cultural traditions in our country. Lastly, we have the idea that Americans support the idea. And this is important to be able to argue that most Americans actually think that some version of mandatory national service is a good idea. So this comes from Jim Norman with Gallup. Gallup, of course, is, is one of the prominent polling companies in the United States back in 2017. The piece is called Half of Americans Favor Mandatory National Service. And you can see here in the graphic, 
uh, that 49% of all adults are in favor of some mandatory service requirement, 45% oppose. If you look at the numbers on age, you can see that support among younger people, not surprisingly, right, is kind of low, but it gets uh, higher and higher as you get older. Uh, support among uh, men is higher than women. Uh, support among Republicans is higher than among Democrats. So to be honest, you know, the numbers here are pretty close overall. As you would expect, they go up over time among people who are sort of past the national service age. But it does show that the idea is at least somewhat more popular than it is unpopular, which at least lets you respond sort of defensively to people who say that this is just fundamentally at odds with American liberty. No, most Americans don't think that. A majority of Americans in these polls think that this is a pretty normal, pretty mainstream good idea. But it is admittedly a close question, which is why it is a debate topic. Uh, and that is actually a really good segue to our last section of the video, which is focusing on arguments for the negative. Okay, so for the negative, I think the place to start is with the core idea of individual liberty. I think when you're debating on the neg, if you're just talking about like practical things like cost and lack of benefits, you're sort of playing defense. And that's necessary sometimes, but you also have to have a core idea that generates offense. In other words, that actively shows a harm from mandatory national service. And there are several ways to do this, but at the core of many of them, there has to be some argument, I think, based around individual liberty. Like we said earlier, people aren't pawns on a chessboard. And at least absent some truly extraordinary circumstances, we can't justify conscripting them as servants of the state. So the first point I have is you have the right to self-determination. In the United States, as we said earlier, we have built a government around the idea of self-determination. And while it took us a long time to make that uh, principle a reality for everyone, now that we've at least gotten closer to that, we should not go back in the other direction. In the U.S., you have the right to choose whether to join the military or not, to join AmeriCorps or not, to volunteer for Habitat for Humanity or not. And sometimes we make exceptions to this rule in truly dire situations like the draft in World Wars I and II, but we're not facing anything remotely like that right now, so there's no justification for requiring young Americans to forfeit their rights, their livelihoods, and or their time at a critical phase in their lives. The right to human self-determination is one of the most universally accepted philosophical ideas, both in political theory and in policy, and it's the foundation for many other rights, like the right to privacy, the right to free expression, the right to due process. We see this in the International Covenant on Human Rights adopted by the UN General Assembly in 1966, which defined in detail the substance of human rights and also stipulated the obligations of each signatory state to promote observance of those rights. The U.S. ratified the agreement, and Article 1, Item 1 says all peoples have the right of self-determination. By virtue of that right, they freely determine their political status and freely pursue their economic, social, and cultural development. Now, I want to add a bit of an aside here. I know that the broad, rather nebulous right to self-determination is, is maybe a little bit less glitzy uh, than rights like, say, education, clean water, free speech, but it is, I would say, an inviolable right nonetheless. And it's important that we call this a right because when we successfully label something as a right, there is this notion that it can't justly be taken away for, for any old, you know, just good idea for any old reason that we think might be marginally beneficial. This is the idea behind John Stuart Mill's harm principle, which says the only purpose for which power can be rightly exercised over any member of a civilized community against their will is to prevent harm to others. What the harm principle basically means is that government can legitimately implement policies that restrict the right to say, you know, own an assault rifle, uh, dump pollution in the river, shoot fireworks in a densely populated populated area because those laws prevent undue harm to others. But the resolution here goes way beyond that. It's taking a huge amount of liberty away from presumably young people. Not just the freedom to do like one thing, but a huge portion of your time and your labor for months or even for years. It's honestly in some ways more like a, a prison sentence really than say just a regulation that you know takes away the right to own a certain type of gun. And even more importantly, if we're going by Mill and the harm principle, it's not a restriction aimed at preventing some specific narrow type of harm. It's a restriction that requires you, compels you to give your labor you know, basically give a year of, of your life 
uh, to some vague conception of the collective good. And if we as a government can tell people, hey, we're just going to claim a year of your life and you're going to work to promote some general idea that we think is pretty good. If that is a power that the government can claim over people, then, then what possible principled limitation could there ever be on the power of government? If we're not going to limit it to just stopping specific harms that you cause, we're going to say anytime we have a good idea, we can just conscript you for whatever period of time we vote on, then have you go do it and we'll force you to do it. Where could the line of government power possibly be? And that leads to a closely related second point, which is conscripted labor is inherently wrong. As we said earlier, we're a country with a terrible history when it comes to forced labor. And are, are we really going to make it mandatory now just because it might create some vague sense of commonality or it might make it a little bit cheaper to fill some potholes? Uh, the basic argument on this comes from Ilya Somin, uh, a law professor writing in Reason Magazine in 2018. And it says this, we rightly abhor the extensive use of forced labors by authoritarian regimes, such as those of the Nazis and the communists. The same principle applies to democratic governments. The fact that a violation of a fundamental human right may have the support of a majority of the population does not make it just. It does not matter if the work the forced laborers are required to do has great value to society. The same was true of much work performed by slaves and forced laborers throughout history. The cotton grown by slaves in the antebellum South, for example, was considered violent vital to the American economy. That fact did not make slavery just, nor relieve plantation owners of the obligation to use only voluntary labor. So the argument here is that the fact that something's good, that it's beneficial, even tremendously beneficial, doesn't justify forced labor. The entire Southern economy in places here like Mississippi was based, unfortunately, on slavery, as Samin says. Does that for a second justify uh, holding people against their will to do labor? Of course it doesn't. There's also this very powerful quote from J.D. Seal on Reason Magazine in 2022, and it, it quotes uh, Frederick Douglass, which is a, a powerful source on this, right? And it says, quoting Douglass, what is freedom? It is the right to choose one's own employment. Certainly, it means that if it means anything, stated Frederick Douglass, the escaped slave and prominent reformer to the U.S. Army's Civil War era policy in Louisiana of extracting one year of forced, although compensated, labor from freedmen on behalf of the federal government. And when any individual, again quoting Douglass, or combination of individuals undertakes to decide for any man when he shall work, where he shall work, at what he shall work, and for what he shall work, he or they practically reduce him to slavery. That's an incredibly powerful quote coming directly from Frederick Douglass. In, if you're in a, a district that like uses more sort of rhetorically focused speeches, right? you might use that as an introduction, but you certainly, I would include that in your negative somewhere. It's a very, very powerful line. And I think a smart approach for the negative here in general is to draw a line in the sand and be pretty emphatic with the judge saying, look, forced labor is inherently wrong. The only exceptions might be, as we'll talk about in a minute, maybe true like existential crises like a world war, and we just don't have that here. So you don't even need to reach questions, judge, like how much economic growth will this cause or how much unity will it create? Uh, you know, I can refute those arguments. I will refute those arguments in just a second, but I really shouldn't have to. You should reject forced labor on its face, on principle, as something that is antithetical to the values of this country, at least the values we have developed, you know, since the horrors of slavery, and you should vote negative. Now, a very closely related argument to that last point is the fact that mandatory service is arguably unconstitutional. Given our horrible experience with slavery, we wrote a prohibition on involuntary servitude right into our founding document by an amendment shortly after the Civil War. The 13th Amendment to the U.S. Constitution states, neither slavery nor involuntary servitude except as a punishment for crime whereof the party shall have been duly convicted shall exist within the United States. Now, to be fair, the Supreme Court did rule that the military draft was constitutional in 1918, but that was smack in the middle of World War I when we had thousands of drafted soldiers already in the field. So many legal scholars think that that decision was politically motivated and think that the court wouldn't follow it and would reach a different result if it heard the case today. But even if it did follow that argument as to military conscription, that is not the same thing as universal mandatory service that extends to civilian service and it extends to everybody as opposed to like a small subset of able-bodied males and includes every person in the country. 
That's why commentators like Doug Bandow, lawyer and senior fellow at the Cato Institute, say, quote, mandatory universal national service, at least if legally required and backed by civil or criminal penalties, would fit the definition of involuntary servitude. The piece that we cited a few minutes ago from George Mason law professor Ilya Samim reached the same conclusion, saying, quote, any such proposal, like mandatory service, is likely to be unconstitutional as well. If it includes civilian service, it would be beyond the scope of federal power. It would also violate the 13th Amendment. Amendment. One of the bedrock principles of American constitutional law is that the federal government only has those powers granted by the Constitution. Other authority is reserved to the states or the people. A military draft is likely authorized by Congress's Article I power to raise and support armies, but there is no such provision authorizing the imposition of mandatory civilian national service. And while constitutionality is not the most important thing in a debate, because like hypothetically, if the judge voted for the AF, then you know the Constitution in the imaginary world of the, de of the debate could be amended to allow for this, the fact that a constitutional amendment, a bar to this exists, and that that particular bar, the 13th Amendment, was implemented precisely because of slavery right after the Civil War, serves as a pretty powerful warning that this is a bad idea. And speaking of terrible institutions that split our country in half, the next point that I have is mandatory national service backfires and actually reduces unity. As we talked about a few minutes ago, one of the major AF arguments is going to be this idea that national service will lead to greater national unity in a time of great national disunity. But I think that there's a very powerful negative response to that argument, not just that it won't increase unity, but that will actively make polarization and division worse. The core of this argument comes from Connor Friedersdorf writing in The Atlantic in 2019, and what he says is this, if mandatory national service were in place today, it would be run, and this is back in 2019, but it would be run by Donald Trump. How would the Trump administration marshal the nation's youth if it were able to compel the labor of each young man and woman, no exceptions? Perhaps the White House uh, political advisor Stephen Miller would help decide where to assign them. Perhaps some would be assigned to help patrol the border. Or say a Democrat wins the presidency. Would national unity be advanced by drafting every 18-year-old with a MAGA hat into national service under the new Democratic administration? Perhaps we would have a culture war fight about whether volunteering at Planned Parenthood should count toward discharging one's obligation. And this is still very relevant today in 2023, and it will probably remain relevant for a long time. For example, right now in 2023, we see politicians like Republican presidential hopeful Vivek Ramaswamy uh, floating the idea of linking the right to vote to serving in the military. And we'll link to an AP story that talks about that. And the basic idea here is simple. You basically say as the neg to the judge, if you vote for national mandatory service, the only thing that your ballot does, the only thing it controls is whether we have national service. After you do that, you hand it off. You don't control it. It gets put in the hands of politicians and they will decide what the service looks like, what the penalty is for non-completion and things like that. And the message to the judge is simple. Do you really want to make millions of young people each year serve at the whims of whoever happens to be president when half the time it's going to be somebody you disagree with? Do you really want to create a scenario where if young people object to serving on some partisan political project like enforcing the border or working at Planned Parenthood or whatever, right? The, the president can penalize them en masse, maybe by like taking away their right to vote or maybe even throwing them in jail. If anything, this kind of mandatory service would probably unite young people against the United States, as it actually did during the Vietnam War. Ed Edward Hasbrook, who is a prominent anti-draft activist, uh, wrote this piece on conscription leading to anti-government sentiment. And he says, mandatory service ignores the consequences of compulsion. Neither the government nor any other institution can impose unity of purpose. The only unity consistently promoted by coercion is unity against those responsible for the coercion. Black, white, and Latino draftees during the U.S. war in Indochina, that is to say the Vietnam War, united against their officers and even more against the politicians responsible for the war. Prisoners unite against their jailers, even across the deepest ethnic, racial, and class divides within prison communities and the larger society. In short, there is no reason to think that national service wouldn't just become another weapon in the culture war. And there's no reason to think it would unite young people in any way, except perhaps uniting them against the government, forcing them to do something that they don't want to do.
Now, let's shift gears and look at some arguments about the lack of any strong, urgent justification for mandatory service. Now, the first one I have is labeled just no military justification, right? So even if we assume that forced labor isn't inherently bad, even if we accept that in some cases it can be justified, we should still recognize that it is a major demand to place on a person. So there should have to be a really good reason why we're conscripting soldiers and workers uh, when we already have people willing to do these things voluntarily for pay. In the case of military service in particular, you can point to our own military leaders to start with, and this is from former Secretary of Defense Ash Carter in 2019, uh, and he says, although we need to maintain the world's best military, mobilization on the scale like that of World War II, when we did have conscription, well, I'm just adding that, is neither needed nor desirable. Uh, Bruce Chapman, writing for Brookings in 2002, goes farther. He says, universal service is not needed on military grounds. We eliminated the draft three decades ago, in part because the armed services found what they needed, that they needed relatively fewer recruits to serve longer than conscription provided. And it's really just as simple as that. We don't need a groundswell of short-term troops who don't want to be there. And even if we did need more troops beyond the full-time professional military that we have, mass conscription is a bad way to get this. So this comes from Doug Bandow again, writing for the Cato Institute in 2019. He says, first, the military doesn't want conscripts or short-termers. The armed services learned during Vietnam that those who don't want to be there tend to develop discipline problems, have little interest in training and education, refuse to take greater responsibility, and won't re-up and populate a career NCO Corps. Moreover, one year of military service is a spectacular waste. Just as someone gets trained, he or she leaves. Robert H. Scales puts in this into sort of more grave language, writing for War on the Rocks in 2013. Here's what he says. The consequences of having a draft today would be even more tragic. On the contemporary battlefield, there's no room for poorly trained, poorly motivated infantrymen. Less intelligent soldiers get killed in hugely disproportionate numbers. Drafted armies are by their nature amateur armies. Soldiers usually serve for as little as six months to a year before being discharged. As we learned in World War II, an amateur army can become professional over time, but the price of learning is measured in blood. It takes years to build a cohesive band of brothers within close combat units. A draft would rush unprepared, undertrained, and poorly bonded soldiers into battle only to get them killed. If you think that post-traumatic stress disorder is a problem in the volunteer force now, just watch the consequences of putting unwilling, poor quality drafted soldiers under enemy fire. At the end of the day, our military is the most technologically advanced in the world. Unlike Russia, we don't just throw millions of poorly trained young people into a meat grinder like you see in Ukraine today. We have a moderate number of highly trained long-term professionals who use high-tech weapon systems, not mass numbers, to fight efficiently and effectively. Conscription isn't just unnecessary to our approach to military preparedness. It's totally incompatible with our approach. The least bad thing that could possibly happen if we had mandatory service in the military would be career military officials having to waste time babysitting young people who are forcibly temporarily assigned to the armed forces, keeping them out of any real conflict or doing any productive work until they had just a short time later when they left. In other words, these actual military personnel with real expertise would be wasting their time and effort, basically making work and babysitting people who didn't want to be there. On a related note, we can add that there's also no civilian justification for mandatory national service. Basically, the argument here is that there's no pressing need for civilian labor that can't be met uh, either by the labor market or by volunteers. So first, the volunteer sector is booming, and this is a good place for us to start casting doubt on the notion that we really need to force people into community service. Again, a decent summary here comes from Britannica's pro-con site on mandatory national service, and I'll cite the original sources as well, but what it says is that 28% of millennials have volunteered a total of 1.5 billion community service hours annually. 26% of Gen Z said they volunteered, 50% would like a job in volunteerism, and 10% want to start their own nonprofits as of 2017. Several voluntary civilian service programs already exist, such as AmeriCorps, Teach for America, and the Peace Corps, in addition to limitless volunteer opportunities throughout the country. Since AmeriCorps was founded in 1993, over 800,000 participants have completed more than 1 billion service hours. Applications outpace funding and capacity. There are 15 qualified would-be volunteers available for every AmeriCorps spot. Forcing more people to participate would be difficult. And not only would it be difficult, it's unnecessary. One thing the negative can say is like, look, if we're getting 15 applications for AmeriCorps for every spot we give them, why don't we just increase the size of AmeriCorps and let all the people in who voluntarily want to be there? 
that should answer just about any concern about like how we're going to do these projects, build infrastructure, clean up parks, teach people and kids in underprivileged areas. If we've got this pent up demand of people who want to do it, we don't have to make it mandatory. We can just let the 15 times as many people who actually want to do it and try that and look. And look, if we do that for 10 years and it's not enough and it doesn't work, then maybe we can come back and talk about some kind of mandatory thing. But why don't we just let the people who are waiting outside the gate to AmeriCorps try do AmeriCorps, like increase the size there, right? And see what happens there before we make it mandatory uh, when we can't even handle the demand that we have right now. And, you know, and while you shouldn't cite ProCon, just, you know, the ProCon site from Botanica in itself, I think you can follow the links to the original sources, which are very solid. Now, beyond just volunteers, the normal way we do public works projects is just to hire workers and pay them. So right now in 2023, the unemployment rate in the United States is remarkably low, but that doesn't mean that there are no workers available to clean up parks or cities or to build low-income housing. It just means you'd have to pay them a little more to attract them. And that leads to a general related point that the negative should be ready to make, which is that the app has to show that its benefits are unavailable unless people are forced to serve. Because for many of the benefits the app will talk about, like training, meeting different people, developing job skills, completing infrastructure projects, and so on, all these things are readily available with volunteer folks in the status quo. Again, the 15 times as many people who want to do AmeriCorps. If people want to learn job skills, there are plenty of volunteer programs and job training programs that can teach those voluntarily. The question is, why force people into it? And in particular, why force people who might actually need the money or need to start their career uh, and why force them into like low paid dead end national service jobs. We might like the idea of like forcing upper income kids from rich families to go get their hands dirty doing community service for, for, for a year or two, right? But what about the kid from a poor family who wants to like start working as an apprentice electrician making a decent wage for his family right now to help his family meet needs? Why should we force him to go across the country, make some pittance because that's all we can afford to pay him and do something that is not going to be his career Career, or it's very unlikely to be his career, like planting trees or something. That's a total waste. And that segues nicely into our next point. There are no long-term benefits of serving. So first, as a general matter, the idea that mandatory national service leads to job skills tends to be a myth. This is from Professor Brioni Hoskins at Roehampton University in the UK in 2020. I'm not going to read the entire quote, but it basically says that there's just very little evidence that volunteer work leads to marketable skills in the UK, and it's even less likely to lead to long-term marketable skills for people who are forced into volunteering. I know that's an oxymoron, but forced into serving, right, or serve for a short period of time. But even if job skills were a common benefit, that still doesn't justify taking the choice away from people who need good paying work and who may have better options. As we mentioned just a second ago, taking a year from away from a kid with a trust fund may not matter too much to you, but taking a year of apprenticeship or community college away from a kid in a low income family who needs it has real costs. And in the long run, as with most forms of forced labor, it's the poor and the marginalized who are gonna be hurt the worst. So going back to Edward Hasbrook, the anti-draft activist we talked about earlier, he argues, quote, more privileged young people are likely to qualify for or find ways to be assigned to the safer service jobs and those that provide useful training and enhance upward mobility, teaching, for example, while the dangerous assignments, fighting forest fires, for example, or cleaning up toxic waste, will remain the sphere of those with less privilege. Any compulsory system is likely to land poor people and people of color at the bottom of the pile as usual. On a similar note, going back to Connor Friedersdorf, who we cited earlier in 2019, he says, mandatory service will be gained by the wealthy, the well-connected, the folks with the social capital to figure out how things work. And national service will be set up in a way that serves their ends and reflects their values and preferences. And lastly, even for those not currently serving, creating millions of forced low-paid workers will drive down wages for other workers. One of the side effects of slavery was that in addition to the obvious horrible, grievous harm to the enslaved people themselves, it also drove down income and wages for non-enslaved workers because there's not gonna be much of a market out there for like well-paid work when you can just force other people to work for nothing. That's why empirically conscription, military conscription has actually lowered uh, pay for career military service members. As Christopher Jen notes, every time a draft has been imposed, the result has been lower military pay. 
Uh, in other words, it, it, the basic thing Christopher Jen is saying here, let me paraphrase a little, but I, I think I could sum it up. If a job is worth doing, it's worth paying a willing, qualified worker whatever the market rate is for that work. If you replace that worker with a conscripted young person, you have three different harms. And I would actually say this in the round. First, you deny the worker who wants to do the job a good paying job, right? Second, you take the conscript, the person who doesn't want to be there, away from whatever they think their highest value is. That might be college, that might be some other job that they want to do, that might be serving their community as opposed to going somewhere else, you know, right? And third, uh, the work that gets done is almost certainly going to be worse because it's being done by somebody who has no interest in doing it and has no expertise in doing it as opposed to somebody who presumably has both. So anyway, as you can see, there are some strong and intuitive empirical arguments and logical arguments on the negative that match up very well with anything that the affirmative can throw at you. So with that, let's come back in just a second and close with some final thoughts. Okay, so hopefully this video has given you some useful ideas on how to start preparing for your first topic in LD debate. But just remember this. If you only rely on this video or on a case that the older kids on your team wrote or your coach wrote or a commercial brief that you buy online, you're going to find that relying on somebody else places a real limit on your progress. Is it possible for a talented kid to just pick up a case that their team wrote and win a novice tournament? Absolutely. But if you want to develop into the kind of debater who can be competitive as a varsity competitor against strong opponents, the key is you have to do the work yourself. And that means you have to read a lot more than just the sources that you put into your case. You have to prepare rebuttals, which we often call blocks. You have to file them away on each topic. You have to learn about the strategies and the terminology in LD debate. And you have to practice against your teammates. Maybe scrimmage against folks from other schools online if you can. If that's not possible, you can literally practice in your own mirror in the bathroom by taking your flows, which is just a word for your notes, right, that you took in past rounds at past tournaments or practice rounds and doing what we call rebuttal redo speeches, where you literally redo the rebuttals from those rounds in the mirror until you get them perfect. You can practice debate on your own. Uh, th this is not something, I will say, that has to take over your whole life. I don't want it to sound like that. It's really not. But it is something where the more you read, the more you practice, the more you write and think, the closer you will get to achieving your potential. It's like lifting weights for your brain. Nobody can do it for you. Nobody can hand it to you. But if you learn to enjoy this process of research and critical thinking, coming up with your own killer arguments and your own great rebuttals and your own clever mic drop phrases, you will get very good at this activity of debate very fast. But it all comes down to the effort that you put in. So like I said at the start, I really envy you getting to start fresh in debate. It's an incredible activity that will absolutely change your life and give you some of the greatest memories you could ever possibly make. At the end of the day, it's hard work, but it's a lot of fun too. And it's something anyone can do if they'll put in the effort. Don't ever let some big team or program or big tournament or superstar opponent intimidate you. Never back down. You are more than good enough. You can be great at this if you choose to. And that's why we close every video on this channel with the core philosophy that we have here at Mississippi State, and that is that debate is for everybody. So work hard, have fun, and hail safe.